Welcome to the Charleston Literary Festival. We are so happy that you're here. <laughs> My name is, I'm Suzanne Pollock, and I am the person that raises the money for the festival, and I plan the parties. I had the most fun job. And th the first thing I want to do is thank our sponsors. They're on here, Ala and Ralph Isham. And they have been amazing sponsors this year, personally. And also, Ala just started a store in Charleston, which is right around the corner on Church Street. You can go right after this. And the store is also a sponsor, and she's giving 20% of all the things that are sold for the next 10 days to the festival. So please go buy things. See, here's, this is an example. <laughs> okay, so now to the business at hand. Um, our first, this is the first session today, and today's interlocutor is David Adams. David is the Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Surgery at the Medical University of South Carolina. And David is just amazing. In his retirement, he keeps raising all his IQs his brain IQs because he takes classes at the College of Charleston, his physical IQ because he runs triathlons, and his, he has such superb social IQs that he is the loveliest man in Charleston. So that's David, and then Marie Brenner is just the most accomplished and cool woman. She, was an, she is an award-winning writer for Vanity Fair, for New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and The Boston Herald. She was a teacher at the Columbia University's Graduate School for Journalism. She was a baseball columnist, the first female baseball columnist for the American League. <laughs> so cool. And she covered the royal wedding of Charles and Diana, and many of her articles have been made into movies, The Insider, Richard Jewell, A Private War. So um, Marie Brenner and David Adams will be discussing Marie's latest book, Desperate Hours, about the New York Presbyterian Hospital and how it persevered through the COVID pandemic. They're gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then you can ask questions. So please just turn your cell phones off and enjoy. How are the acoustics? Can you hear me? All right, well, welcome all of uh, you worshipers of great literature. So this uh, has been a great start to a festival, and I just want to thank Walter and Diana and Suzanne for getting things off to a great start, and especially to Marie for giving me the chance to talk with her for an hour. Actually, I will only talk for 45 minutes, and then I'm going to stop. And then I'm going to instruct those who wish to ask a question to grab the mic and to hold it in front of their mouth and stand up and ask a question that ends with a question mark. <laughs> I'm going to start with a quotation from an assistant professor of medicine at New York Presbyterian. This is Elizabeth Olsner. The press did not get the half of it. People were wearing scrub gear. and they were showing up, and they were doing their best. And their best was not good enough. And you knew that. The disease was so bad, so many were going to die, no matter how good you were. However bad you think it was, it was so much worse. So you've written eight books. Three have been made into films. How is this book different for you? Well, first of all, can I just say, it is such an honor to be interviewed by you, of all people who understand hospitals, who are chief of surgery, of what goes into a hospital system. And it is an honor for me to be in Charleston, this historic church. It is extraordinary, the Literature Festival, so I am thrilled to be here. Everything about this book and the reporting of the book has been surreal and astonishing from the first moment, David. I mean, how it happened, just to give a little context, let me set the scene. It is June of 2020. I stayed in New York during the lockdown, and 
it was a time in New York where we were hit by a rocket, as all, all the cities were, but New York hit, was hit first and it was hard, fit, hit hardest. And I live quite near New York Hospital, the old New York Hospital, which is now called Weill Cornell in this mega system of New York Presbyterian. And all night long, there were the sirens that you've seen, you've heard, and it was quite an extraordinary time. In June, just when the peak had started, when we had come down a bit, I got a call that was just astonishing to me, that the CEO of New York Presbyterian wanted a reporter to come in and tell the unvarnished truth of what his people had gone through in this system. And I had to listen twice to the person who called me about it, because it just seemed so out of possibility. I mean, we all know hospital systems. They are filled with regulations. They are, you know, they don't let the doctors speak. The doctors are muted. They're run by corporations. And I said, it's just, it's nonsense. It's they want a PR thing, the brand. They want something to talk about the glories of the healthcare workers and everything they did. And they said, no, 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 no. We think it's legitimate. And you know what? It turned out it was absolutely legitimate. So, I started reporting that summer in this vast system, and it is, imagine this, it's two major New York academic centers and two Ivy League medical schools, Columbia and Cornell. These hospitals used to compete with each other, and now they're merged. And then it is every, in every borough, there is a New York Presbyterian um, smaller hospital. So you go from lower Manhattan, all the way to Columbia, to uh, obviously Weill Cornell, then you go up to Inwood, which is the, t the very top of Manhattan, a very you know, mixed part of town. There's Queens, there's Brooklyn, and there is Bronxville, Lawrence Hospital, where incredibly, COVID began in New York City with a lawyer who lived in the suburbs of New Rochelle as the first patient, and that's how it began. So the hospital, uh, one of the, the big themes during it was the gag order, uh, censoring the doctors, keeping them from telling the truth, telling them that, well, free speech is different during a disaster. How did you get beyond that uh, gag order that was instituted? Oh, that was a constant frustration. So I'm a storyteller, so I don't really write about hospital policy. I'm obviously not a doctor. But what I look for always when I'm working is the people of all classes and castes who cut underneath the hospital system, who can take you into the drama of what happened. So early on, I think it's, it's worth to sort of back up and talk about process, because 37,000 people in the New York Presbyterian system. How do you find a cast, as we say in narrative writing? Who is your park ranger that is going to take you through? Who are your characters who can actually sort of illustrate on every level of the hospital system what it takes to function in a crisis? And early on, I began hearing about this extraordinary doctor, an epidemiologist named Matt McCarthy, who, I mean, of all things, he had, um, played for the, 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 the Anaheim Angels in the farm team. He'd gone to Yale and been on the baseball team with Ron DeSantis. He had, you know, it's like incredible. He had trapped bats uh, for, during the Ebola crisis before he went to Harvard Medical School. And I kept hearing about this amazing, and also he's a best-selling author. He writes about uh, very difficult infectious uh, germs that you can't, uh, easily cured in a book called Superbugs, and I, he wouldn't talk to me. I said, no, I, please, Dr. McCarthy, I really, you know, we're doing this. He said, no, 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 absolutely not. I chased him for a year, and when he finally agreed, I had heard this amazing story, which is that he went out to warn New York City um, on March the 3rd. This is just when the pandemic was beginning to hit New York and the mayor and the governor still wouldn't shut the city down and the level of virulence was so high. And this incredible, brave young doctor went out on Squawk Box and he said, I'm here to tell you I've just come from my hospital. He didn't name the hospital. And he said, there are no tests available in New York City. 
Only 32 people have been tested in New York State so far. And don't go to the hospital. It's going to be, we're going to have to shut down the city. We are in a desperate situation here. So that day, and he went on, and it was like the most extraordinarily important public health information that our politicians were not giving us. By two o'clock that afternoon, it was a headline on the New York Post on the digital side. By three o'clock, he had his first call from the, one of the heads of New York, of Weill Cornell, on the corporate side, telling him, we speak in one voice, you are not allowed to do this, your tone is alarmist, this is wrong, Dr. McCarthy, absolutely wrong. I mean, we're talking about one of the foremost experts on epidemiology, if not in the city, if not the country. And by four o'clock that afternoon, he was threatened with losing his title of running one of the medical pavilions at Weill Cornell. And this was my, when I heard this story, I was absolutely astonished. Um, here's a doctor, most brilliantly trained, who is not allowed to warn the public of what he is seeing, direct experience, because he's under a gag order. So what I learned again, so much to my astonishment was that in these hospitals, you have a war, a sec, a, let's say a cold war, between the corporate side, I mean, you're laughing because you've lived it, of course, right? This corporate side and the medicine side. In the medical schools, they believe, especially at Cornell, in straight academic freedom that the doctors must be able to speak out openly. The corporate side, absolutely not. They're constantly worried about branding. So now you have a once in a century epidemic. You have a public health catastrophe. This is not a hurricane. This is not a flood. This is a pathogen that's circulating. The very people that you want to hear from, I would think, and the, certainly the medical schools thought, were the doctors and what they were seeing, how they were treating it. But in academic medicine on the corporate side, there is a strict gag order policy. And that's what I walked into. So during my career in the last two decades, I noticed that some of my brightest colleagues, instead of going for NIH grants, were going for MBAs. And what they wanted, they wanted to get a seat in the C-suite. And so they are the ones who became known as the suits, as opposed to the real doctors. <laughs> so this conflict plays out just beautifully in this book. And there are the heroes that show up. So when corporate tried to fire uh, Matt McCarthy, the chief of medicine, Arthur Evans, says, no, he, he doesn't work for you. You can't fire him. So he, he stayed uh, in position. And he said, not only that, see, that's right, he said, not only that, he's going to be running our COVID response in this <laughs> hospital because he's probably, you know, the best epidemiologist we have. And so he did. But this tension went on, this vindictiveness went on, and it wasn't limited to just Dr. McCarthy. It was the chief of surgery of Columbia who wrote those beautiful, beautiful letters in the Wall Street Journal. You remember Craig Smith from yeah. Columbia? Uh, Bill Clinton's heart surgeon, probably you know, one of the most preeminent heart surgeons we have in America. One of the first calls he had when this first letter he sent out to his surgery department was from the COO of one of the hospitals saying, what do you think you're doing? You can't give out information that we don't have enough mass. What do you think you're doing? I mean, we're talking to, about Craig Smith, probably, you know, again, the level of expertise. On every level this was going on, and I think it's a scandal. So yeah, so yeah, Craig was, was a, a great rallier of troops, and so he reminds me of Alexander the Great, who before every battle would get on the ramparts and have this stirring speech to rouse the troops. So he was really very effective in his use of words, and uh, I think my favorite missive he sent out was... Uh, Come on, Balco, it's time to go. <laughs> and no one knew who Balto was, and this was the, 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 the Alaskan sled dog, sled dog who in the 20s brought diphtheria, you know, say, Balto, we mush on, we mush on. He would go into these grandiloquent kind of Walt, Walt Whitman kind of soliloquies in his um, letters, but they were beautiful. So when uh, Diana asked me to 
be an interlocutor. I was delighted until I picked up the book and I read it <laughs> and I turned to the first page of writing and there were three pages of a list of characters, of 118 characters. And I said, oh my God, how, how can I get out of this? <laughs> and it was too late, fortunately, because every character in that book uh, has a backstory that's beautifully told and they're all intertwined and, and tell a, a story that could not be better told. We live in a time when we say, What's, that was pre-COVID. We're already talking about that, like that's BC. It's pre-COVID, pre-World War II. Uh, so this is a, a difficult story to tell, but you were able to put a microscope on it, uh, looking at that hospital that just tells it in such a spectacular fashion. Thank you. And it, to walk into the hospital and to understand that, for example, in an ICU run at Weill Cornell, there is a woman, Lindsay Leaf, in her mid-40s, had to send her children away for three months, is running a unit which is essentially in charge of turning the entire hospital into the ICU. All the COVID patients are coming through her unit. She comes from a background where her grandparents had met at Bergen-Belsen. Um, she is a healer, lost 20 members of her family during the Holocaust, and all her life just wanted to save lives. Dr. Leaf, Lindsay, is now put into a position where there are no supplies, there is a complete catastrophe. This is the number one healthcare system in the city. It's Mount Olympus, and she has a nurse who has to run from closet to closet, finding half-empty boxes of N95s because they are the lung unit, that the, the hospital doesn't have enough mass for them. This was a six-week drama that hit New York that brought together the skill set of everyone on every level, from the modeler who no one would listen to the fact that he had correct projections, to a housekeeper in this unit where Dr. Leaf is, who would literally work triple shifts and had rituals to protect herself from the patients. All of them came together in the theater of the hospital um, on this mission to save people. So uh, Craig Smith liked to use the battlefield analogies and there's a lot of talk, well, this is a war, this is a war. So one of his phrases was, it's a time for battlefield promotions. Our next generation of leaders will emerge in these few weeks. And it reminded me of uh, my daughter, Laura, who when she graduated from college, Tom Brokaw was the speaker and he spoke about the greatest generation, and she was really pissed. She said, I don't want to hear about that generation, I want to hear about my generation. But Craig Smith says, well, this is our next generation. So it reinforces my view that every generation is the greatest generation, or we would have perished a long time ago. So uh, one thing that this book demonstrates is the advantage of diversity in the hospital workplace. So there are so many uh, women doctors working there, so many children of immigrants and immigrants. Uh, what are your favorite stories? Well, where to begin? So I work with storyboards, and I wanted to follow the chronology of how the pathogen had circulated through the hospital system, but also through the larger canvas of New York and the epic battles that were going on between the governor and the mayor and the public health department. So I worked my way, and probably the first week of my reporting, I found myself in Brooklyn talking to a respiratory therapist named Felix Cusid. Arrived in America at age 16 from Russia, his parents were refuseniks. You know, they fought, they were, they were Jews that left uh, Russia during the 80s. And they had to live in a homeless shelter. He's the son of two doctors. They worked as um, just like janitors to support themselves. And 
Felix always wanted to be a doctor, couldn't, of course, afford it, became a respiratory therapist, and became absolutely fixated by the time he was on in his 20s by the history of ventilators. He winds up you know, somehow apprenticing to someone who had invented the small machine called the baby bird, which was what got children off uh, in polio of the uh, iron lung. So when I went down to his small basement office, I, I walk into this Miss Havisham parlor of two rooms that every ventilator that has ever been used in America since the 19th century, copper tubing, special things, that he has acquired this sort of museum of ventilators. And he said, you know, this is a very weird hospital. He said, when they acquired Brooklyn, because Brooklyn was one of the ones they, the, the system acquired, they wanted me to throw out this. They said it was just a bunch of junk. And I, they, and I said, they go, I go. My ventilators stay. And they sent the head of HR, and they, he, he said, I gave them the tour of my ventilators. He said, OK, Felix, your ventilators stay. This man worked 100 hours at a time through March and April. He probably saved more lives than anyone in the system, but more than that, he's an autodidact of ventilators. So through the entire elite system, they were calling Felix Cusid, <laughs> respiratory therapist in Brooklyn, to say, we have a possibility of getting these broken ventilators from the National Guard. Here's the serial numbers. Are they any good? No good. What about 108A72? That's good. So the kind of ingenuity that was going on inside the hospital. There is another, do another doctor, an anesthesiologist, who was charged with helping outfit all the ICUs at Columbia. These ventilators would come broken from the governor from Albany, and they, had, they would come in, and people were desperate for them, and there was no tubes. He, he gets an idea. He calls the Graduate Department of Engineering at Columbia, and he said, I have no tubes. We need these ventilators. They won't work without the tubes. And he, they said, oh, no problem. We can fabricate them on a 3D machine. He gave them the specifications. Within 24 hours, someone came up in a Honda in the driveway of Milstein at Columbia Hospital and said they popped the trunk. There were hundreds of these fabricated ventilators that the grad students had made, and the ventilators worked. Those sort of stories were going on all over the hospital. There was an extraordinary group of young women surgeons at Columbia who invented something called the surgical SWAT team. Oh my God, when I interviewed Beth Hockman, Dr. Hockman, she comes in with her like wonderful raspberry fleece, so elegant, completely non-egotistical, this incredible surgeon who runs one of their graduate departments. And she described the fact that, you know, with the hundreds and hundreds of people who were coming in, they couldn't breathe, they couldn't pant, they had to do intubations with the pick lines. She said, why don't we have all these, we have all these surgeons who aren't operating because the surgeons, the, all the surgical rooms are being used as ICUs. We'll give them all the tools and backpacks and we'll just dispatch them around the hospital. So they were practically on rollerblades, you know, going around Columbia doing these intubations in the emergency room to move the patients out faster. And then there was the introduction of the Zephyr valve. Oh, yes. That was a great uh, yeah. innovation. Again, if you go to these, every unit in, in a hospital is um, it's a kind of a rainbow in New York of every class and cast. And in Lindsay Leaf's unit, there was the most extraordinary surgeon, Ben Gary Harvey, a pulmonologist, who had grown up in a barrio in Colombia. He could barely even speak English when he was 18 or 19. He went to medical school in Colombia. In Colombia, his mother worked sewing in the Bronx to be able to support all this. She gets him to New York. He qualifies on his med boards. He came to Weill Cornell with a resume, and they looked at him and they said, oh, "Don't even apply here." So he had to like, he worked at you know the Brooklyn Downstate and this hospital, and that's. He finally gets into Wild Cornell. He gets his dream. And a woman is on a ventilator for four months. And she had been very athletic, very fit, all of 50, and she's literally dying. There's huge holes in her lungs. And he had been working with a small clamp to treat COPD, and, which is a, a lung issue. 
And he said, I'm gonna try these clamps on her lungs. They fought him, they fought him. I mean, this is where Tony Fauci trained. They said, you can't do that, she'll die. And he ran the unit one day a week. And the day he ran the unit, he said to the nurses, I'm gonna get her husband to agree. We're gonna get her scanned. Get these portable valves from all over the hospital. Let's take her into the scanning unit. They did it, she was, fine. She was not fine, but they said, we can do this. He put the clamps in, guess what? She went to her son's wedding six months later, and she's now traveling with her friends. She's completely off oxygen, and she's back to her normal life. And he, when I interviewed him, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, you know, if you don't get out of your swim lane in a hospital system, if they just let you not do what you want to do, you never make progress. And I think, David, that's one of the things that moved me the most. The exhilaration of watching these doctors, these medical gladiators on the front lines trying to figure out the cures and the treatments that no one had ever tried before. And they were doing it first. I mean, steroids, for example, were used for almost the first time in Dr. Leaf's unit, mm -hmm. where Ben Gary Harvey, the Columbia doctor, was as well. It, I got reminded so often of the Walker Percy statement is, why is it that only in times of illness or disaster are people real? And so many of these people were so real, and you do a great job uh, covering the entire hospital hierarchical pyramidal structure. And one of my favorites was Marjorie Walcott, the housekeeper. Uh, the daughter of a share of someone who had come to America from Jamaica and worked as a cane cutter and uh, had supported the family, came up to New York, worked in a morgue, uh, you know, had to run away from the morgue. He wound up working at Wild Cornell as a, a janitor, and she joined her father. Uh, some years later and was working in housekeeping. She's so devoted to these doctors in this unit that she calls them my doctors, my sweethearts. They're very protective of her. And, you know, she again was working the triple shifts. But, you know, one of the, the larger issues this raised for me doing this was the whole notion of how we react in a crisis. I have to say, what really drew me into writing the book in the first place was my own dreadful fear of hospitals. I hate hospitals. I'm de terribly afraid of them. I don't want to go in. I don't want to be subject to infection. I, you know, who hasn't been in those rooms where we're all like waiting for someone that we love? How are they going to be treated? That atmosphere of tension. But yet when they came to me to say, would you consider doing this, I just didn't hesitate for a moment because I've always believed as a writer that fear is what, where you find your story. Anger and fear. And the fear that coursed around all of America in, this, in these last dreadful years, I mean, is something that we're all still coping with. So for me, the larger questions were, how do they do what they do? How do you do what you do? How do you show up in a crisis? How do you come together for the common good? What is that thing that brings people together to help save others? So Roseanne Rasso, uh, who was the director of nursing at Cornell, raised the question, do we really need to put a 98-year-old nursing home patient on a ventilator when ventilators were being rationed? She said, I walked into one of the patient rooms and the strongest nurse we have was sobbing. She was overwhelmed with grief. Yeah. Her patient load had doubled and she had a helper nurse who did not know how to be an ICU nurse. And somehow uh, they just kicked it in and uh, you know, were just remarkable heroes in all this. And the question that arises in that sort of situation relates to ethics in a disaster. And I'm sure on many of the nurses' minds were the five days at Memorial issue. Absolutely, and on the doctors' minds, yeah. So this, again, was something that erupted through every hospital in America, and particularly in the New York hospitals because they were hit first. And that was this notion of when there's not enough supplies for everyone, not enough ventilators, who gets them, who doesn't? 
the level of what the doctors call moral injury that hit the doctors and the nurses with the situation you described from uh, Roseanne Rosso. It has affected every doctor in the hospital because, of course, they're trained in medical school with ethicists. So they would call the ethicists and say, I've got five people in the, in, the, in the emergency room here, and they all are desperate and they can't breathe, and we have two ventilators, and no, 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 we show on the computer, there's one in the basement. Well, where is it? And these doctors, you know, are like, they're, vent they're, they're intubating 11 and 12 people a day. And they're saying, there aren't here, there aren't here. And they, they'd say, well, the governor, you know, there's these triage rules that unless crisis conditions, crisis management rules are uh, implemented in a hospital, um, you can't, you, ha you have to give a patient, even a 95-year-old, a ventilator, otherwise, you know, you could be accused of murder. And this is what Five Days of Memorial so brilliantly details. So this was going on, and this extraordinary moment when I met Dr. Leaf for the first time, and she said that the most surreal moment for her had been when the CEO of the hospital was FaceTiming with her uh, in the ICU, and she simply started sobbing and said, you know, I can't, I'm, I, I, we're, we're overwhelmed here. You know, we, we don't have ventilators, we don't have anything, our patients are dying. And you know, here's Corwin who is saying, don't worry, I'll stand behind you legally if it comes to that. And it's like, you know, I'll sign off on it. And when, they, when this call ended, a doctor who worked with her said, that's absurd. He's going to go to court, the CEO of New, York, of New York Presbyterian, and is going to say, I signed off on this. So this kind of drama was going on you know, on an hourly basis in the, in the hospital system. There, uh, there's a great uh, scene in the emergency room in the Queens Hospital uh, when the director of nursing says to her assistant, she says, well, I'm, I'm coming in, you've got young kids. Uh, you stay at home and take care of your kids. And she gets there and the emergency room is just overwhelmed. So she talks to her CEO, uh, Linda Farisi, who says, this is crazy, this cannot be true. Are you admitting appropriately? Yeah. So th there's this always this sort of chateau generalship. Where From the, the suits, Where yeah. the, the generals are in the chateaus That's drinking right. the wine out of the cellar, and the front troops are getting gas. But there are people who actually show up in the front lines. The chief of medicine and pulmonary would go to the ICU every day uh, to uh, buck up the troops. You know, one of the larger issues that comes out of this that we're all dealing with now and we're going to have to deal with is the notion of doctor burnout, which is a very, a nurse burnout, which has come out of the pandemic. In the last two years, there have been 51% of the doctors in America now say they have had it, they're burned out. Um, at New York Presbyterian, I know they had a, something like a 15 or 20% fall off in doctors and nurses. 300 doctors in the last few years have committed suicide. Imagine that, 300 doctors. The, the rate of burnout in New York is much lower than around the country. It's 19%. But you know, you're seeing the reasons why. I mean, the seeds of corporate medicine, that here these doctors are, and they get this once in a century, not the corporation's fault, once in a century pandemic, and they're hit, and they have major medical school bills they have to attend to, $300,000 some of my doctors had as bills. They cannot get fired from the hospital system and they see the corporate side making millions of dollars a year. The people who are telling them on the front lines, no, 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 it can't be nearly as bad as all that. And it, it's quite extraordinary. Do you know that there are 30 times People are going into hospital leadership at a 30 times rate higher number than they are going to medical school, that that's the new thing because of the money you can make. And the doctors and the nurses are so inside the hospital system, have to go around. It's like a split screen projection. You know, they're brilliantly trained, they're making decisions on a, every day on a life and death basis, and then, you know, they watch, you know, these big 
uh, buildings getting built, and they're infantilized, they can't speak out. If they speak out, they get fired. It's quite something how, we, how our health care system has become so broken. There, there are still some great heroes in there, and you raise the question, how did the modelers get it wrong for yes. so long? And then there's that great guy, Nathaniel Hubert. <laughs> so one of my favorite characters is um, an amazing sort of... Um, Poly, polymath, autodidact, um, who is both a doctor, he's a clinician at Lower Manhattan, which serves a, a, a kind of a, a less uh, elite population close to Chinatown, and he's also worked at the CDC at doing disaster modeling, which is different than disease modeling. As a, as a young man out of medical school, he was put in charge of a group to try to figure out how you get antibiotics through all of New York in case of a terrorist episode. And they were going to stage their first training episode um, literally two days after 9-11. So imagine, he wakes up, just his training exercise is set for September 14th, and he wakes up and he sees the World Trade Center blowing up in front of him like two days before his, his own first experiment was going to go. But he winds up becoming a kind of an expert on how you move crowds in a hospital and how what happens in a crisis. And he knew very early on um, probably in late December, early January, that something horrible was coming from Wuhan because, of course, he's a modeler. And he tried, he was one of the first people pulled into what they called the Red Dawn chain. Do you know about these emails? So one of the points we haven't covered yet is how the doctors dealt with the failure of the federal government and their state governments to, of any kind of a leadership. And you know they were getting literally, even from January and February, a lack of government response and anti-science coming from the White House. And so these extraordinary rogue operations in Washington and in the hospital systems would erupt and to try and cope with this. So one of my favorites was at the Department of Homeland Security, there's a medical director who was an expert on crisis, and he knew that he had to pull together in total secret, a man called Dwayne Canova, um, the top modelers and epidemiologists in the country to, have to go back and forth with what they were seeing and feeling. This is now January of 2020, and to trade information. And this, they pulled in Dr. Hooper almost immediately. And it grew to be 30 or 40 people trading information, what was the best solutions. And because the Department of Homeland Security could not get into the White House planning of this. And so finally, the New York Times broke this. But Dr. Hooper kept trying to alert the New York Presbyterian system. You think it's this, it's going to be that. Why is, why would it? And he just kept getting blown off for, you know, like weeks and weeks and weeks. And I heard about him. I called, reached out to Matt McCarthy, the epidemiologist, about six months after I had started reporting with him. And I said, you know, Matt, surely there has to be someone in the whole brilliant New York Presbyterian $9 billion system that saw this thing coming, that knew. He said, oh yeah. And I said, well, what happened? He said, <laughs> he said, you better go find Nathaniel Hooper because in two weeks he's leaving the hospital system, he's taking a sabbatical and he's going to Oxford to work on a global modeling consortium because of what happened here. And literally, I went, into t I went into the city and I met him when he was surrounded by his packing boxes and his cargo shorts. And he began within like an hour, he had his laptop out showing me these emails that had been dissed, things that had not been answered. And he and I, he then became an, a major character in the book. And it was such from a reporter's point of view as a storyteller to follow their emotional trajectories yeah. as they lived the cycles of this. So talk about the emotional trajectory that you experienced with the people you interviewed, because many of them were very vulnerable uh, with you oh. in what they talked about. Oh. How, did, how did you get to that? 
Well, on my first reporting out in Bronxville, because again, I'm following a chronology, uh, we were gathered around a conference room, and I noticed that one of the chiefs of the ICU, his hands were shaking. And, you know, this was, they began to talk about what this was when they realized that they couldn't do anything, that they were powerless, that in the system that, you know, that they had been so brilliantly trained for, that they didn't have the medications, they didn't have the supplies, and not only that, because of the way all the government and the state regulations were, they weren't shutting the city down. You couldn't get people tested. Their frustration, how you deal with that. And you know, several, you know, a lot of these, a lot of our healthcare workers have not, have yet to get over it. You know, they're still, and it's sort of an interesting thing that's happened. Dr. Corwin, the CEO of the hospital, Stephen Corwin, who trained as a cardiologist and who's a voracious reader and an amateur historian, you know, I, I think that he was so rocked in the summer of 2020 because mm -hmm. he too, at one point he announced to the entire hospital system, the cavalry isn't coming, by which he meant the White House. We are in this on our own. Imagine this, he is the CEO of a $9 billion healthcare system. And he was, so, he was still so vibrating that he was determined to find out what had happened in the system. And uh, I didn't realize how uh, handcuffed they were because they had no tests, but they could have done it. They could have made hundreds of thousands of tests a day. Uh, Sitting at Columbia in a lab was a Roche testing machine that was not being used, that could have tested in the first two weeks of the pandemic 5,000 people a day. The scientists, the Nobel winners at Columbia, were just going in and testing themselves off with antigens <laughs> off a recipe book. But yet, and I would say to these doctors and these corporate heads, well, why didn't you just go rogue? Why didn't you just say, look, we can test 5,000 people a day. We've got people in our ERs. We don't need the approval of Albany. We didn't, you know, this is a healthcare emergency. Oh, no, 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 we couldn't do that. They would, quote, shut down the hospital system. At, you know, inside the hospital, many people would say, when I would say, well, this is what they say. They said, oh, right, in the middle of a public health crisis, they're going to shut down the number one health care system in New York City, sure. And so, you know, the do they were disgusted. You know, they were disgusted by the corporate shackling, the regulations that the hospital had. You know, in the most egregious examples, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, you remember people believed that no one should be wearing masks because the masks only protected the doctors, not the patients. You know, that, of course, like the fact that but imagine that the heads would go out into these hospitals and say, you do not need masks unless you're front facing with a COVID patient. I mean, at one point I heard at one of the hospitals, not New York Presbyterian, there was a corporate memo that went down to, this is a premier hospital system that said, don't wear masks in the emergency room, you will scare the patients, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so another very important story that comes up is the identification of systemic racism in medicine because you have these wealthy Upper East Side and uh, West Side hospitals and then you have Queens and, and uh, Southern New York uh, where disparities in care became quickly oh, this evident. This became a huge issue, and again, another issue which was became a tremendously, like a moral fervor for the doctors, so that it, you're, at some of the hospitals, you had a one to six or seven patient nurse ratio. At some, it was as bad as one to 13 or 14. And many of the doctors felt that this was race disparity. Um, I don't know if I agree with them. I mean, it was a point in New York where you couldn't get extra nurses. They were hiring. New York Presbyterian did a billion dollar outlay. But certainly, race and gender disparities have been a huge issue, continue to be a huge issue. Uh, recently, at a literary festival over the summer, I was approached by um, several nurses who worked at 
one of our main academic systems, uh, doctors in the, in the emergency room, who had been fired because they tried to point this out to their healthcare system and they had been fired over us. I'm writing about this now. But um, it's, it, again, you're, it's, it's like a split screen reality where well-meaning, well-intended doctors and nurses who are trying to save lives are trying to poke at these corporate systems that run health care to say this is wrong, and they get, they get uh, slapped down often for it. There, there was the uh, physician who, you know, was wondering whether he should write a letter pointing this out. Uh, oh, yes, that's one of my favorite stories. And so there I was, am Spartacus. <laughs> I am Spartacus. So there was this, and there is an extraordinarily bold uh, doctor, Harvard Medical School, where he had worked with the homeless of Boston, and he wanted to go to work in Lower Manhattan, one of the, you know, again, one of our poor neighborhoods, uh, because he wanted to work with that population of every kind of language and the homeless population and the immigrants. That was, the, that was what he wanted to do. And in the middle of the pandemic, when they had no beds and they had very few masks and the supplies were so limited, he just, he and his colleagues, who are so devoted, just decided we've got to get a petition going and get the hospital system at New York Presbyterian to realize how wrong this is. So they did a very well-researched petition, and they floated it, and they got many, many, many signatures, and they sent it to the New York Times, which delayed running it. So it begins to percolate up in the hospital system that this is going on. And the head of the medical school suddenly emails him, we need to get on the phone. So they get like a 50 call, 50 people on the call, Zoom call. And this extraordinary doctor, Art Evans, who runs their hospitalist doctor system, has this kind of lanky Texan, native Texan. His father was at the, one of the heads of Baylor Hospital, so he's grown up inside corporate medicine. He doesn't take it, you know, he knows to, how to stand up to them. So he started saying, you know, there was this slave Spartacus, and he was trying to um, foment a rebellion, you know, and I'm looking at this petition, and I'm thinking, Okay, so you know, Spartacus's followers, he told them, you just say if that you get caught, I am Spartacus, we're all Spartacus, we're all gonna be Spartacus on this call. So in other words, the head of the system was telling all these rebellious doctors, this is good, this is great, and you know, you're all, you're all doing this. And so they started doing this campaign around the hospital system with a button they made called I Am Spartacus that they all wore. And they, the petition ultimately, you know, this whole story broke into the New York Times several weeks later. So we could uh, keep talking for hours, but I wanna open the floor to questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please, Raise your hand and grab the mic. So uh, we have one here, and while the mic comes over, I have a question I want to ask is, are they going to make a movie out of this? <laughs> There's, there definitely is talk about it. Yeah, there definitely is talk about it. And I think what's so interesting right now, right oh, go ahead, here. go, go, please. Oh, well, it's, it's just, we're in this lull moment right now in, in the country where we're in the United States of immortality. And this is like revisiting this history, which is not so, which we're still sort of in, is, you know, it's very, it's, 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 it's created a kind of, and it happened after the 1918 pandemic as well, it's created a kind of a void around the subject. So there's a kind of amnesia around the subject. Michael Lewis's book, um, The Premonition, which many of you may have read, that wonderful book about the modelers who saw this, it's being adapted and the screenwriters were told, okay, well this is all very well and good about these modelers, but look, here's the thing, you cannot use the word COVID in this movie. No one <laughs> wants, it's a true story, no one, no one in America wants to think about the pandemic, they've had it with the pandemic, they're fed up, with, but no, 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 but you don't understand, this is a drama about modeling, it's about science. No COVID, that is a Warner Brothers policy, not, the word COVID <laughs> cannot be used. True story. Please. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. This was so enlightening. Um, I have a question, and it sounds very conspir conspiracy theory. Bring it on. And that is, <laughs> that is given that um, corporate now controls medicine, isn't it in their best interest to cull all of the people who are expensive, such as the elderly and the immunocompromised, etc.? Oh, that really is dystopian. Yeah. <laughs> Where does that come from? <laughs> well, you know, I think that they still, their mission is still to save and cure and heal and bring you in so they can make money on you. So it's like, you know, they want to bring them in, bring everyone in so you can get four MRIs a day and they can make, but now, I think their intentions are, it's their intentions are healing, their intentions are medicine, their intentions are the mission of medicine. I, I can't go that, I can't go that dark. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question over here. Yeah. Uh, Marie, thank you. That, this book was just an extraordinary work and I think it's, it's really, really important. So thank you for it. My question is the CEO who originally invited you to come in and, you know, quote unquote, tell it like it is, what does he say now after the publication of the book? He he was he was very very compliment. He was very you know moved by the book. And he called me just as he just when he read it um, as it was going to press. It had just gone through their legal review for patient privacy. It was the only restriction I had. And he said, "Look, I took a lot of hits in this, but boy, you know." I mean, he I think he just I don't think as a, since he's all the way up there as a chairman don't think he understood because you don't, you know, you're, you're siloed off. You don't really understand, you know, to read about the, the Marjorie Wolcott's, you know, the, the share, the, 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 the sugarcane cutter's daughter who's working triple shifts in your hospital for $700 a week, you know, to understand about a Felix Cubes, about a Lindsay Leaf who doesn't see her children for months because she's running this ICU. The emotional weight on them and that, you know, that they, that they would talk about it and so that I was able to dramatize what had actually gone on in the theater of the hospital. Uh, I think it was over, I think it was just illuminating for him. As we say in my church, if you are able, will you please stand with your question? So everyone wants to see you. I realize your research was done here in America and in New York, but in listening to you talk, I'm wondering if any of the physicians you interviewed shared with you if they had any knowledge of if there was a different dynamic overseas in European countries, for example, or in Canada, where they don't have our corporate healthcare system. Good. Or was it the same chaos and bureaucracy everywhere? And I'm wondering how big a factor our healthcare systems problems were in responding to the pandemic and if it was worse here in that sense than in some of these other countries? That is an excellent, excellent question. So, so many of them all, you know, they've trained with and they were communicating sometimes several times a day with friends and colleagues in Italy, in Lombardy, in South Korea, you know, the, the, the dean of the medical school of Cornell, Augustine Choi, was on the phone constantly with China, uh, you know, with South Korea. You know, there, it's, this, is a, this is a global, this was a global thing. And the countries we know now that did the best in the pandemic were those like South Korea, like Singapore, like the countries where everyone was on the same page, where the, the public responded to the restrictions, where the restrictions, as in South Korea, they were, they were all over it. America couldn't do that for a lot of different reasons. And I think that is, for them, in the healthcare systems here, the greatest failure of what they, the realization of, you know, when the pandemic started, they all believed that they would have what it took to handle it. For whatever reasons, they didn't. They didn't have enough supplies. No, no hospital system can be expected to prepare for a once-in-a-century pandemic. It's just out of a, it's out of a hospital playbook. Also, 
public health warning systems are not hospital systems. Public health systems operate on a different way. They try to prevent crisis management. The CDC, as we all know now, stumbled and fell terribly. They, they, there were so many botch-ups in the CDC from the testing kits from everywhere else. You're running a hospital. Your tradition, your respect is for the CDC. It wouldn't occur to you that the CDC could botch it. You know, again, I can't fault the hospital system for, you know, suddenly they're part of this kind of epic, you know, Bermuda Triangle of disaster that hit every single one of our government systems. Yes, Nathan, please. Is it, uh, you said a little on this, but how, how did you see uh, medical workers navigate the risk to themselves and to their families, and even seeing uh, the, them lose some of their coworkers as they're trying to, uh, to serve patients. Were there any stories that really stood out to you on that? Oh, yes, my God. I mean, it was, it's a, you know, a, I'm glad you asked that. You know, again, this, oh, they were, the emotional, the emotional uh, consequence on them was astonishing. I mean, it was horrifying. One woman, Lorna Breen, who ran the emergency room at Inwood, the small hospital that's just north of Columbia, where they were so overwhelmed, they were literally, patients were dying in lounge chairs. She wound up committing suicide. She couldn't take it. 35 people died in the healthcare system. In Lawrence, where they were told by the COO of the hospital early on through an all-hospital briefing, you don't really need masks till you're patient-facing. Five workers died in that hospital alone. The anger that went through the hospital about what they felt was a failure of being protected, at many of them felt this way. And also they were frightened. How are they going to take care of their families? You know, at one point, um, the back office workers were just in the third week of March. Remember, this is all happening. It's a drama. It's like it's all happened within about six weeks in New York, March and April, where it, things were coming at them. People were dying so quickly. This and a very high level of vir virulence of this virus. So it wasn't safe, and they were panicked. But I have to say, New York Presbyterian did something quite extraordinary. Again the CEO just said, I don't care what it costs. You know, he said, they put out a billion dollars. They had you know, 36,000 meals for all the families, the workers' families, extended families. They had thousands of, hos of hotel rooms that they um, rented for their workers across the city. They did everything to protect their workers um, in a way that most other hospitals couldn't, were not rich enough to do or wouldn't spend the money to do. And I, I do think that, that when, after that began to kick in, I think that the hospital workers and the doctors felt much more supported. So let's uh, call it quits, unfortunately, now. This is the first time I've been on a stage that nobody fell asleep. And so thank you for your attention and for your good questions. Amazing.